So I'm going to talk to you today about and uh, show you a few examples of integrating geochemical and mineralogical data. First of all, I th I'd like to thank the AIG and also the AAG for supporting this um, one-day seminar. Uh, Comstock Metals, Qatar Mining, Piedmont Lithium have all uh, provided case studies, and uh, um, most of the work that I'm going to show you was done while I was employed by CSA Global. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the BG discovery in uh, the Yukon. Well, can we see that mouse? No, we can't. Um, that's an orogenic gold deposit. Uh, then I'll look at the Jebel here, porphyry copper gold deposit in Sudan. Look at Glen Wills. That'll be a petrographic example, which is, I think, a thing to always remember with all the sophisticated tools we have for mineralogy now. There is still, I think, a place for petrology in our studies. Uh, and then I'll finish off looking at Piedmont lithium. So there's a lot of data that we can integrate together. So geological information, let's not forget that. Geochemistry, mineralogical, metallurgical information, geotechnical, geophysical, and environmental information. And basically, this information spans the whole lifespan of a project. So if we look at the VG discovery in the Yukon first, this was discovered in 2012. Uh, it has a small uh, resource associated with it. It's in the area of the Golden Saddle um, deposit, which is controlled by white gold at the moment, uh, and the coffee deposit, which is Gold Corp. You could put uh, Newmont in there now. And we're going to look at uh, one of the discovery drill holes. So we're going to be looking at this drill hole here, number four. <coughs> So one of the things you can see if you plot the geochemistry, now this is four acid geochemistry day, data that was supplied by Comstock Metals. If, if we look at a, a molar ratio plot of sodium against potassium, so in, in this case sodium on the y-axis, uh, potassium on the x-axis, we can see that we've got a good spread in data and it's showing us a couple things with regard to wall rock alteration. You can see that we're moving some samples up towards the, the albite. Um, node on this diagram, so we have some albitization happening. But the majority of mineralized samples are losing all their sodium, so we're dealing with feldspar destructive alteration. And you can see the, uh, both the color and the size relates to the gold content of those one meter intervals. So the, uh, the geochemistry was done on one meter intervals. And you can see some shots of, of uh, rock samples or drill core samples from some of those drill holes. Uh, a very obvious sericetic alteration associated with, with the wall rock alteration. Now what we did was we, we took a split of some of the coarse reject material from two drill holes, and I'm just going to show you data from one. Uh, the analysis were done by the Bureau of Veritas on their high logger in Perth, uh, and so they gave us some data. I'm only going to show you a little bit about of that. The first thing to note is the, uh, the nice gold zone here. And it's, it's quite, quite abrupt, and there's not much indication on either side of that that you're in proximity to gold mineralization. If, if we look at that sodium to aluminum ra molar ratio, you can see the, the almost complete loss of sodium out of the system. That's our wall rock alteration. So perhaps a slightly broader zone is highlighted by, by the alteration. The uh, ICPMS antimony is quite strong and provides a slightly bigger halo. And then finally, in the bottom right-hand corner, I'm looking at the wavelength of the uh, ALOH absor absorption peak from white micas. Uh, and I should point out that Sasha uh, did the interpretation of the hyperspectral data through OSPIC. And you can see we have a, a really good trend associated with a decrease in the wavelength of that absorption peak. And again, that defines quite a broad zone. So the additional thing about these two diagrams on the right, the antimony we could have picked up with portable XRF uh, in the field, and the white mica shift related to the wall rock alteration we could have picked up with a handheld spectrometer. Whereas we had to wait about a month to get that information, we could have had something in near real time in the field. And if we plot that data back up on a, the uh, sodium, potassium, aluminium molar ratio, ratio plot, 
we can do things like start to bring in the geological logging uh, from the drill core uh, and the log alteration. And you can see we can now start to provide feedback to the geologist on site uh, as to how their logging is going. And in the case of picking the potassic alteration, they were picking potassic way up in here. And they obviously weren't getting that right, so I'm not sure what they were looking at in the drill core. But we can provide a bit of feedback as to uh, the appropriate interpretation of what they were looking at. But whereas all the samples here with the high gold uh, have the short wavelengths uh, associated with muscovitic white mica compositions and uh, we're long predominantly as anchoritic alteration or sericitic alteration. But because we have very high potassium aluminium ratios, we probably have something other than white mica uh, associated with the mineralization. We probably have a bit of case bar alteration as well. Next, I'll, I'll move on to the Jebel here, uh, porphyry copper deposit in Sudan. So this was a bit of a surprise, um, uh, both for us at CSA Global as well as to uh, Qatar Mining. Um, it's a very rare porphyry copper gold deposit in the Arabian Nubian Shield, um, hosted largely by a granodiorite dacite porphyry complex. And the uh, copper gold mineralization consists of magnetite, pyrite, chalcopyrite, bornite. So the study area is located right here, and this work was all published a few years back in, in uh, ore geology reviews. And so a map of that alteration has this broad area of quartz sericite chloride uh, associated with a, a Stockwork zone, which I might point out was mapped by Carl Rohart, who's in the audience today, and will be speaking later this afternoon. Uh, and then we have some advanced argillic alteration, and then a zone of uh, sericite pyrite alteration there. And they have, through drilling, identified a bit of potassic alteration in the core of the stockwork zone. I don't have a lot of data that I can tell you. The, the geochemistry that uh, we published was basically whole rock geochemistry to identify rock types. Uh, but because you're in the middle of a, a, a quite a extensive alteration system is very difficult to find fresh material. And one of the things we did in that project was we did um, uh, XRD analysis of all the samples. So what I've got here, the samples are colored by different zones and then sized on the right by the percentage of muscovite in the sample and on this side by the percentage of, of chloride. And you can see Moving towards that node, even though we don't have a lot of data, you can see an increase in muscovite as we have that feldspar destructive alteration in place and the loss of sodium. And on the other diagram, we move towards the, the uh, origin of the plot uh, because we're, we're losing both potassium and sodium out of the system to form chloride. Now an example where petrography was quite informative in looking at a gold deposit in, in eastern Victoria, the Glen Wills deposit. You can see mineralogically it's quite complicated. So we have, we have some free gold here with about 20% silver in it, so electrum. We have orostibite, uh, which is relatively rare, but particularly common in this deposit. And some of that orostibite appears to have been altered around the rims to uh, a very high fineness gold. And then we have some gold in, in a variety of sulfur salts. So if you, if you take a, a fire assay for this sample, you're going to get a total gold. But the sulfur salts and the orostibite are refractory, so they're not going to report to, to a cyanide leach. So in terms of just doing a straightforward total fusion for analysis for this sample, it could potentially give us a misleading result. And the metallurgical test work that had been done previously on the project consisted as of, of a single sample collected underground where they had access. Um, whereas you can see, there's potentially a lot of complexity involved in the mineralogy. So one of the things that I did while I was working on this particular project was we um, we did leach well analysis. So you can see two columns here where we have the standard or the original 25 gram fire assay analysis, and in some cases a repeat. But then we did a 200 leach well 
uh, an accelerated cyanide leach, for those of you not familiar with it. And then in addition, we did a fire assay of the tails, a 25 gram fire assay of that. You can combine the two values to get now a, uh, a complete gold value for a 200 gram sample. So we have better precision because we're using a bulk sample. But in addition, we're getting the percentage of soluble cyanide in the sample. And you can see it varies considerably from less than 10% to as much as 98%. And you can see as well some of the benefits of having the, the greater bulk is that some of the samples from the, the bulk analysis, the leach well analysis, uh, are giving slightly higher grade than the original 25 gram fire assays. So finally, a, a final case study of, of how we might integrate geochemistry and mineralogy is a calculation of normative mineralogy. Um, CSA has been involved in a project with Piedmont Lithium in North Carolina for the, the past two or three years. Um, the company has put out a, a lithium resource for that project, but because they're located in, in the eastern seaboard of the United States, there's a potential market for some of the byproduct minerals coming out of the processing stream. So that's things like quartz and albite, uh, case bar and muscovite. So what we did t in order to calculate those to incorporate them into a resource was we had uh, whole rock uh, total fusion XRF analysis done of all the samples which had been captured within the lithium wireframe and calculated normative mineralogy for those samples. And on that basis, we're able to bring out a, re a resource estimate for the byproduct uh, quartz, albite, and muscovite. So uh, in summary, being a geochemist, I'm a little bit biased, uh, but uh, I think geochemistry uh, is important through all aspects of the mining cycle. And if you are going to be integrating geochemical and mineralogical data, it, it helps if you, if you have that in mind when you're sampling and so that you overlap in your sampling. Uh, and once you have that data, you can use it to cross-verify or cross-validate your interpretation, say, of the geochemistry. And using some of the field portable tools, we can come close to, to near real-time analysis and decision making. And uh, increasingly, we have large data sets now, and so I think it, it, uh, it requires integration to get the best value out of them. And so I'll finish there. Thanks.